Welcome to this week's St. Clair County Board of Commissioners meeting. The types of business that occur at these meetings include public hearings, official voting on actions by the Board of Commissioners, presentations by departments of the county, and recognition of service that makes our county great. As your elected representatives, the St. Clair County Board of Commissioners is committed to improving the lives of all our residents while preparing county government to meet the demands of the future. In order to do that, we need to share our thoughts and plans with you. More importantly, we need you to share your thoughts, concerns, and opinions with us. We encourage you to come and experience the process by attending any of these meetings. They occur every first and third Thursday of the month at 6 p.m. at the St. Clair County Administration Building at 200 Grand River Avenue in Port Huron. Okay, we'll call the uh, uh, St. Clair County Board of Commissioners Human Services Committee uh, to order and we'll have roll call, please. Uh, Commissioner Samasco. Commissioner Tomian. Commissioner Heideman. Here. Commissioner Riley. Here. Commissioner Rushing. Commissioner Graytop. Here. Commissioner Bohm. Here. Four, three, four, six, one, nine. Okay. Uh, if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, is there any additions or uh, deletions or changes to the agenda? Make a motion we approve the agenda as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, uh, are there any citizens to be heard tonight? Okay, seeing none, uh, how about updates? Any updates tonight? Uh, conceptual initiatives? Uh, old business? Uh, new business? Uh, Resolution uh, 13, the 17 Area Agency on Aging 1B Annual Implementation Plan. Uh, tonight, hey, we have with us uh, Tina Marzoff. Would you like to step up, please? Welcome. Thank you. I know you had to do some real hustle to get here because of the accident out there. But I should know better than to leave at four o'clock to come to St. Clair County <laughs> from the direction I came from. So, um, but yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. Um, we come to this uh, board of commissioners meeting at least once a year and send quarterly updates on the resources that we receive from the federal and state and also the uh, $14,000 of a county match that we use to provide services to um, uh, older people, primarily older people in this county. We work very closely with the uh, Council on Aging Serving St. Clair, uh, who is a um, major provider in the community. And um, we present this plan to you uh, so that you have an idea of how we're gonna be using about $2 million of, of uh, funding here in the county, and what are the programmatic objectives that we're gonna be focusing on for the next uh, year. This plan that we're presenting is actually a three-year plan. We're required by the federal government to prepare a three-year plan. It's kind of like a strategic plan, but we do update it annually and bring annual updates to you all. Uh, so this is our three-year plan, 14 to 16. It does not include any uh, budget cuts that may come as a result of sequestration. It also does not include any, uh, about $500,000 of statewide additional money that's been allocated for home delivered meals. Uh, we, did not we have not received the formal notification of that allocation yet. We do anticipate that the region will receive about 250,000, I'm sorry, uh, 125,000 of that 500,000 statewide will come into the region and a portion of that will come to St. Clair County. But we will continue to update you in our quarterly updates on that financing as we get the resources. Um, I, I think you must, you probably received a, um, uh, like a summary, 
you should have received a summary of what's in the plan. And then you may have um, printed for yourself, and I did hear from um, a commissioner just um, a few moments ago, um, the full plan. The full plan's about 270 pages, and I didn't uh, take note that there is an error in one of the um, focal points in St. Clair County. The former Cherry Beach site has now been moved to the Washington Life Center. I'm very familiar with that center. I've been there several times. That's on page 45, by the way. I noticed that the page you had told me 51, right? I did. I did catch that. Uh, so we'll be making that correction. Um, as a, as a result, we have an intern that uh, updates our community focal points, and we'll make a note on that. As I, um, I guess the biggest thing, the biggest areas that we're really working on now in the county are bringing evidence-based health and wellness programs into the county. I would say that's the most important um, program that we're bringing into the county. We're also working to bring in extra resources. We've lost about 28% of our state funding for senior services. Um, the sequestration coming in the third quarter was also more impactful than it would have been had we received it at the beginning of the fiscal year. Our fiscal year starts October 1st, uh, and sequestration did not hit until the third quarter. So um, what we've done is we have prioritized our home delivered meal program over congregate meals. The fact that you have a nice a very nice and you just uh, increased your senior millage here in the county means that the seniors here in St. Clair County are very very well um, protected um, from from some of the other um, economic impacts um, funding funding a lot of the human service program so that was a real blessing we were very very involved in um, working with Laura Newsom and the whole committee that was involved in the um, millage increase that was successfully secured um, so, if there's any questions on the area agency plan, I'd be happy to answer them now. Commissioner Greta. Mm -hmm. Lisa, on, um, I, I noticed that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, representation under, uh, we currently have a vacancy for an older adult representative in St. Clair County. You, that vacancy has been filled by Vern Bartley, who actually has moved from our business um, sector over to the older adult sector. I don't. That position is now filled. It is now filled. It seemed important because I see Macomb, Livingston, and other places are being represented. Obviously, we would want representation as well. You are where we are lacking representation is on our advisory council from St. Clair County. The board of directors is represented by Vern Bartley and Commissioner Riley, who's our new commissioner, and, and we're happy to uh, have him. Um, yes, we do need more members of the advisory council. They, they're very active in uh, advocacy positions. I work very closely with Laura Newsom. There was a man that used to be a county commissioner. His name was Wally. And I've really been trying to reach him. He um, knew he, he, he was very interested in senior issues. If anyone has his phone number, <laughs> I would love it um, because I think he might be nice for advisory council if he had an interest in it. And by the way, it is a ways to come to an advisory council meeting, but we are we have technology that people can participate via phone. We draw from all six counties. We're a regional entity, so um, we do cover 29% of the state's older adult population. If any, if you know of anyone who's interested, I've been working primarily through Vern Bartley and through Laura Newsom. But if you do know anyone that would like to serve on the advisory council, we could use more representation from St. Clair there. Also, there's a vacancy, and it's called DHS. Department of Human Services is um, a, a, an area we always try to have somebody from the Department of Human Services. And actually, your Department of Human Services representative recently uh, retired. She was excellent. And I'm blanking on her name just because I'm standing here in front of you. I just think it's important that we represent when Yeah. But St. Clair County, we do. We're, you're you're very well represented on our on the board. Vern Bartley has been the chair, and he doesn't really ever miss a meeting. He was also our finance committee, um, so very well represented on the board. But we could use more representation on the advisory council. Thank you. Any other questions? I uh, no question, Tina. Mm -hmm. But I but I uh, attended the the meeting in June. Yeah. And uh, I got to admit that I, I was really taken back a little bit how well it was run number one as first meeting I attended but the uh, one of the big things that the focus is is trying to keep people in their homes mm -hmm. rather than sending them off to assisted living etc and I and I think that's uh, as I said that day and I have to say now that I think that's extremely important for some of our people that because of not only economics but they don't want to leave their home 
and the programs you're working on and the program you showed that day I thought was just excellent. Thank you. Yes, we do try to support people wherever they want to be, but we know that most people do want to stay in their home. We Most of our services are for services that keep people in their homes. And now with our evidence-based programs, we're really working hard to help people to understand what their chronic conditions are and how to live with them in the most successful way. So it's not that we're against nursing homes. It's not that we're against assisted living. There's a lot of great places to live in the community. The most important thing is to be in the community, obviously. Um, but we do try to keep people in their homes because we know that that's a strong desire. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Just, just one comment. Uh, by the way, we picked the older member of the board. To <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, not only uh, do when you keep a senior citizen in their own home, uh, it, it is also financially much cheaper to do that. Is that correct? Yes. We um, The cost of keeping someone in the home is generally a third of the cost that it might be in another setting. Most often the reason for that is because the home itself is generally paid for and um, we have to, you know, we maintain the taxes and things like that. The other reason is because there's local informal supports that are in the community. So for example, um, maybe millage funded services, maybe neighbors, family members, whereas if you go into an institutional setting, you know, you have to pay for all the different levels of staffing. You, you just can't leverage the um, informal supports is what we call them. Uh, so there are things that are not covered by tax dollars and that, that you, don't, you don't have to privately pay for. Um, so yes, that's very true. It, it makes economic sense and it's also what people want. There is um, a very strong, um, very strong, um, I guess, historical um, preference to spend tax dollars on institutional care and the Area Agency on Aging is, works very hard along with the local service providers to um, change that bias to really make it uh, home and community based as a first option for people rather than um, you know, um, 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 just uh, a secondary option or um, a limited option. So right now for tax funded purposes for long term care services, nursing home care is a right, an entitlement program. Any other type of care is an optional program and that's why it's so limited. And uh, we are working very hard to change that. We feel very strongly that as the population continues to age or live, as I like to call it, um, as people continue to live, um, they are going to want to have tax dollars more directed towards keeping them in their home where we can leverage informal supports and um, be meeting what people want, um, which is you know to be able to age in their homes. If they can. One follow-up question. Yes. Uh, and and that would require a federal change to there, to make yeah. that happen. There are um, to, both to federal and state requirements, but but federal certainly on the nursing home side. Not that there's anything wrong with nursing home care, and we need nursing homes. So I want to be perfectly clear. What we are pushing for is that home and community-based care is an op is not just an option for people, but that it could be. Um, uh, the, a first option, home and community first, and that and that if you're going to spend one third of the dollars, wouldn't you know if, if it was if tax dollars were, for example, in your pocket, which you know technically, theoretically they are, would you want to spend one third of your money to take care of your needs before you'd spend three times as much to take care of your needs? Of course you would, right? Wouldn't you? try to find the thing that was the most cost effective that would meet your needs. It's like gasoline. You know, you don't have to buy the 92 octane if the 87 octane works, right? You know, you buy the 92 if you need it for performance and you need it, to, you know, your car is knocking if you only put in the 87. So that is a federal change that needs to occur and there's a lot of um, reasons to support that. And um, I think a lot of folks don't really understand why we should really be focusing on that, particularly as the population ages. So it is federal. We can, do, we can work very hard at the state and local levels to be encouraging that. Most of your millage dollars is going towards home and community-based care. So you're, getting, you're leveraging um, and you're supporting the home and community-based network in doing that. And um, you know, the simple answer to your question is yes, it's federal, but there's a lot of other layers and a lot of other government, a lot of other lobbies uh, that are involved in that. So it's, it's a complicated issue. I'm simplifying it, but as best as I can. But your answer is, the answer to your question is yes. Changes have to occur and they should occur soon, hopefully. 
Any other uh, questions or comments? I would make a motion that goes out to the full board. No support. Second. We have a roll call on that, please. Uh, Commissioner Samasco. Yes. Commissioner Graytop. Yes. Commissioner Heideman. Yes. Commissioner Bowman. Yes. Commissioner Riley. Yes. Thank Either, you. Thank you very thank much. You. And if you have any, and I knew you might have some uh, literature you wanted to leave or any pamphlets so you can leave them on the table if you like. We'll make okay. sure they get in the right spot. I'll do that. I'll leave some general information. Okay. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. the uh, effort coming up tonight, yeah, too. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, other uh, human services matters. Okay, information only. Make a motion to receive the file, items A through B, and information only. Or All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, Move, we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'd like to call the St. Clair County Board of Commissioners Judiciary and Public Safety meeting to order. Clerk will take the roll, please. Commissioner Samasco. Here. Commissioner Tomian. Commissioner Heideman. Here. Commissioner Riley. Here. Commissioner <coughs> Rushing. Commissioner Baum. Here. Chairman Greatop. Here. I uh, don't see any additions or deletions. Does anybody have anything? I move the uh, approval of the agenda as presented. Support. Move and support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, an update, uh, item 4A on the 9-11 service plan. Mr. Kaufman? Yes. Um, I, at a uh, previous board meeting, the issue of how we currently fund and distribute funds that are um, collected through the 9 -1 -1 service charges that all of us see on our phone bills was brought up and administration was asked to like take a look at our current process and um, formulas for distrib distribution of those funds. Also look at um, how the recent change to the amount of the surcharge um, that would be coming back to the county might affect that distribution um, and report back to the board. Um, if we were distributing it in the most efficient manner and if there were alternatives available for doing so. Um, staff has been meeting and reviewing some of this. We did discover at uh, one of our internal meetings a few weeks ago that some of the very basic information that we were looking for um, was going to disappear. Um, and that is um, information that's very essential to the current formula that we use. Um, we did some scrambling the uh, 911 director did, as well as staff in the accounting department, to try and track down what was going on, see if we could gather that information. It was, it was the line count information that normally is distributed on July 1st of every year. And I'm sure all of you realize that the line count um, information is essential. It's kind of the backbone to how we distribute those funds. Um, under our current, um, our current uh, distribution plan. Um, the accounting department was able to track someone down um, at one of the telecommunications companies that um, was able to provide us with the information. We're not sure if we will be able to get it in the future, um, but that's something that I think all of the 911 centers throughout the state of Michigan, as well as the state of Michigan, is trying to determine right now. And the um, reason that's so critical for us is because our 911 plan has the formula, the line count is the piece. Correct. Of, of the formula, distribution formula. Exactly. We take the, the total of the funds, divide it by the, the line count um, based on geographic um, representation, and the funds are distributed accordingly. Well, it looks like in the future that line count information may not be available to us. So staff is in the process right now of exploring alternative methods of distributing those funds. Um, we've got calls out. Um, the uh, um, 
Uh, 911 director has um, made some contacts with some of his peers throughout the state to determine what others will be doing. As soon as we have some recommendations and alternative approaches that we can present to the board, we will do so. Um, we think that probably um, at um, your August meeting we'll be able to present a report with a list of alternative methods as well as a recommendation on how we might move forward. Any questions for Mr. Kaufman? Commissioner Samasco? Bill, the, uh, the plan that you're talking about, is that contained and filed with um, and adopted by the state? Is that something the state passes on or is that something the board had formally adopted? It is a plan that the board adopts. And that's a statutory basis for us to adopt that? Correct. And we've met that. So is there a, um, is there a, re a review process or an update process on, I mean, maybe we should look at it from that angle is, is update that so it takes care of it. Correct. And I had some concerns about the um, 911 dispatch uh, advisory board. There's some bylaws. I think we should look at that whole piece of it since there's been some changes in the community. I I'd like well, an opportunity eight, to do that. Eight years, ten years ago, um, uh, I've been on the board eight and a half years ago, the cell phone VoIPs, you know, all that stuff that was still coming into, you know, fruition as far as the funding pieces of it, uh, I, charges yeah, attached. I get that, I get that. And, yeah, so we need to review. Right. We need My to point review. is can we, maybe we should review the whole piece of it and get all, all those pieces put together that and better I reflect. I agree with you because okay. it just documents uh, eight years ago kind of thing, so we need to look at, you know, because the state's changed as far as charging now and cell phones and those types of things. Commissioner Eidemann? But, but that's how we, back then, determined to pay for the uh, build-out of the 911 dispatch when we went to 800 megahertz. Is that correct? It was. I believe that is an element of the plan. That, that, yes, that how was, it would be built out and funded. And funded. So, yeah, so we need to get a handle on it. Yeah, there has been a lot of changes. The world has changed. The technology has changed since the plan was adopted. And certainly one of the recommendations we will be making is that that plan be revisited. I think Commissioner Semestle's point was well taken. We really need to look at the whole package and not just do one piece of it or two pieces, but look at the entire package and make sure that when we're done with it, it services everybody the way it's supposed to. I agree. If it's been that long uh, since the beginning and time flies, I think I agree. I think that should be look at the big picture here. Very good. Anything else, gentlemen? Moving on to conceptual initiatives. Hearing none, there is no old business. Under new business, um, 7A, the interagency agreement between family division and community mental health regarding day treatment night watch. Uh, I see Gary uh, Rutowski is here. Gary, if you would uh, fill us in, please. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, this is an annual agreement that we have with community mental health. Uh, they provide our clinical services at our day treatment night watch program. Um, the total of the agreement is uh, over $190,000 and our uh, obligation of that is only $59,507. Uh, and for that $59,000 we get the services of two clinical therapists uh, who provide all of our clinical services at the, the program. and. If we were to go outside to get that, I would dare say uh, we would probably be spending the whole $190,000. So it's an excellent deal for us, and uh, we're ask or I'm asking that uh, you approve the agreement tonight. Questions for Gary? I would uh, move the approval of the uh, uh, interagency agreement between Family Division and Community Mental Health regarding the day treatment night work watch center. Motion. I did have a motion to second. So go ahead. Gary, with some of the changes that may be uh, happening over at the juvenile center, is there should there be any reference in this contract that we might reference some of the changes you've been talking about recently? Not at this time. We're actually meeting with community mental health next week to discuss that. Okay. So we're uh, hopeful that they're going to uh, be able to give us the same type of deal. So it might be a separate contract or amend this contract? Yes. That's it. Okay. Okay, thanks, Gary. Any other questions? All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of sending this on to the full board? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
and <coughs> carries it will go to the full board. Item 7B is the fiscal year 2012 Homeland Security Operation Stone Garden Grant Agreement. Make the motion. I would support that. Uh, well, motion to support to send it on to the full board. Any discussion, any questions? I have one and I don't know who to direct it to. Um, I see that we're getting about $164,000 and it's to be divided between the St. Clair County Sheriff's Office, St. Clair County Marine Sheriff or the Marine Patrol, City of Marysville, City of Marine City, City of Port Huron, Clay Township and Michigan State Police. Does anybody know how that is divided up? How, does it, how is it determined as to who gets how much of that pie? Most think every it's my understanding that it gets distributed evenly amongst the um, nine different entities that because I know for example Clay Township's about sixteen thousand. If you look at this and you do the math on it, percentages. Don't take that to the bank though, but that <laughs> but well, that I, is that I, was my I had heard before that it's it's divided up into pieces and each agency gets one piece or they might get two pieces the sheriff gets two or three pieces of it i guess i'm kind of wondering what happened algonac used to be in here and now that the sheriff has taken over algonac does the sheriff get another piece do you, you, know, do you know how that works yes, yes, all right yes, so you get a total of three of the pieces now you get four and then each of the other entities would get one one piece. Okay. Commissioner Sasko. Uh, they okay. the question then for Bill, when we do the distribution, is that then by uh, that's by board resolution or do we have uh, emergency management does that do you have oversight? How, how does that work? I have not seen requests come to me for distribution of those funds. I think it's something that's done internally between the individual departments, emergency management, and then the accounting department. We can certainly find out for you. I'm just so curious. I, the would protocol. Think that I know that our emergency management is a subordinate of your office, so you'd have oversight, and then that's our connection to that process. I would like some information on that. Um, it's a lot of money, at least no the process I, I believe in all honesty I have talked to Jeff Friedland before about it and he does have a policy in place as to how to distribute that money and if that policy was established by this board at some point I don't know that's that. my question is what degree of input had the board does the board have in the past or present in the distribution okay Bill can we get that information before the full, full board? board certainly can all right well if we send this on then to the full board and we get that answer by that time will that satisfy Yes. Okay. Then I guess I would be open for motion. Did we already have it? Yeah, we already have it. Yeah. Well, good. So need a vote. All right. Then, all in favor of sending this on to the full board? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Any other judiciary public safety matters? <clears throat> None. Information only. Uh, we have a board of canvassers appointment. Uh, I think our clerk made an appointment to um, Dean Bolderoff yep. to the board of canvassers. You have an E911 technical surcharge pool financial statement, and you have an amendment 2012 13 child care fund balance approval for information only. I would be open to a motion to receive and file those. I move. Second. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Motion received and filed. By vote. Second. Moved and seconded to receive and file of the packet. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Adjourned. Move we adjourn. Support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Looks good, Steve.
like to call the St. Clair County Board of Commissioners Environmental and Public Works Committee meeting to order. Uh, Madam uh, Clerk, Mr. Clerk, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Uh, would you take the roll, please? Commissioner Samasco. Here. Ta Commissioner Tamian. Commissioner Riley. Here. Commissioner Rushing. Commissioner Graytop. Here. Commissioner Bohm. Here. Chairman Hyde. Here. Uh, <clears throat> at this time, uh, uh, are there any additions, deletions, or changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Did you want to make something final action first? Uh, no? yeah, yeah, go ahead. We could. You want me to move that 7A become final action? Would you please? I so move. Okay. <clears throat> this time, uh, I, I need a, a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Support. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed, nay. Motion carried. Uh, we have an amended agenda. Citizens to be heard. Do we have any citizens to be heard? Uh, seeing none, any updates from commissioners regarding environmental or public works meeting? Uh, just a comment, if you didn't make it to the Sand Fest, you missed out on a great event and a great party. And uh, I'm sure that with its success, we'll, we'll definitely see that again next year. Uh, any conceptual initiatives from administration? Not this evening. Okay. Uh, any old business? None listed. New business? Uh, first item would be the light station equipment building electrical work. Mark Bouchou, Director of Park and Rec, is here to uh, fill us in on the details there. Good evening. Uh, this year's project at the light station is a, to install a barrier-free restroom in the equipment building. If you're not familiar with that, it's the four bay garage immediately inside the gate. As you enter the gate on the right hand side, there's a four bay garage. In the historic structures report that was approved by uh, the uh, National Park Service when the county took over ownership of the property, included a goal to uh, install a barrier free restroom in that building, if you recall. Uh, last year there was a restroom installed in the fog signal building. So this would be the two barrier free restrooms uh, to service the property. Uh, we have broken the project up into pieces and parts as you uh, may know. Uh, Tim May is our park operations supervisor that supervises that project so he's, general, he's acting as a general contract and we're breaking out the various trades to do uh, the work. Uh, side design did the schematic I think you had uh, included in your packet for how the work would be done and then Mr. Ways, Mr. May solicited the various trades. Um, most of the trades pieces came in well under $5,000 and did, did not need your action. However, the electrical portion of the project that includes moving the main electrical panel from that building and the service from the current room it's in, which will be the restroom, and moving it up on the second floor. So added substantially to the work. Uh, Mr. May uh, received, solicited from many contractors but received three proposals for the work, and that's included in his memo that should be in your packet. Russell Electric, TNT Electric, and BNT Electric all submitted bids and Russell Electric was the uh, low bidder at $11,313. Uh, just to clarify, in the second page of Mr. Russell's proposal uh, included uh, $2,519 of additional or alternate work that we have decided not to do and that the other contractors did not bid on. So it, it is an apples to apples um, solicitation. So our recommendation is that you award a contract to Russell, award the project to Russell Electric for $11,313. Uh, 
Uh, Russell Electric has done uh, not a lot of work, but several jobs for us and this comes uh, as uh, great credentials and is highly respected. Okay, um, did we get a motion on this? Uh, I would entertain a motion. I'd so move. Okay, Support. for final action. It's supported by uh, Commissioner Graytop. Uh, any questions regarding this? Uh, Could you make a record, <coughs> uh, Mark, of why final action is necessary? I just must be some need. Do, do you want to comment on that? Well, the, the project can't start until the electrical panel gets moved, and they all, the rest, all the other companies are waiting in line because this one exceeded the $10,000 threshold. That would just start the process two weeks sooner. And I allows. assume the park is quite active this time of year. The area is quite active or no? Uh, it was very active last week, yeah. and uh, <laughs> this could have minimal impact on the average uh, visitor that comes to see the lighthouse in the fog signal building so it can easily be done that, uh, right now so i just wonder why uh, you might uh, just uh, elaborate a little bit on how much fun they had uh, busting through the concrete to, to try to put in uh, the sewer yeah apparently in the 1930s the federal government built buildings the last there the concrete floor <laughs> that like one of the pieces that we're doing internally is taking out sections of the floor where the uh, sewer lines would go and there's rebar wire mesh you name it and uh, we have a couple of strapping young seasonal employees that have uh, met their match in the concrete and the floor <laughs> go ahead um, Mr. Gray top if I'm not mistaken I think Commissioner Heidman mentioned that eventually the museum is going to put the gift shop over into this building that is the uh, the, the original plan that we're moving towards eventually larger space a larger space but even before they do that they'll use this as a rental space and programming space so they'll so start using it immediately is the, the in and the out so you're going to be able to get the people coming and going faster i mean you won't lose these people the sale of these people because they have to go right by that whereas they have to walk across the park to the other well, side. well in order to do the tours and t uh, ticketing for the tours they have to go in the gift shop right now the current gift shop Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, could we get a uh, roll of call on that? Sure. Uh, Commissioner Samasco? Yes. Commissioner Bohm? Yes. Commissioner Riley? Yes. Commissioner Graytop? Yes. Commissioner Heideman? Yes. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. <coughs> the uh, irrevocable letter of credit renewal for the landfill we do this about every other year don't we yes make the motion for second, second. Uh, this will be passed on to the full board any discussion uh, all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed nay uh, Sheldon construction accounts receivable write-off at the landfill So moved. Moved by Commissioner Bone, second by Commissioner Samasco. Yeah, well, well we tried. We'll send this on to the full board. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. <clears throat> Uh, fixed based operator concessions agreement aviation express for the airport see Kathy's here do you have any questions actually I'm going to talk a little bit about this um, we well as you many of you know we purchased the buildings out at the um, airport from Orzel aviation Mr. Orzel is in the process of um, retiring where he's going to move and kind of slow down a little bit. Um, so that really leaves a void for a FBO out at our airport. Um, we in the past have went out for FBO respondents. Um, never really had a lot of luck and let's face it back in 08, 09 people weren't beating your door down to do that line of work either. When we went out this time, we received four different proposals from different individuals. Uh, we put a committee together on, on our end of it, Kathy, um, Jeff Beckett. We have a actually an airport 
advisory committee along with commissioners. Myself, Bill, you were part of that. Uh, Carl Tommy was part of that. Mr. Kaufman brought the different individuals in, interviewed them, and felt that this individual um, was the clear choice to be the one. So then we directed uh, Kathy along with, uh, I know Gary Fletcher and some of the others to work the process to get an agreement to come back before us for services. Um, and uh, so hence, that's where we are today. If I could add to that, I thought it was a, a very good process. Um, quite a few meetings, a lot of hard work um, for viable people. And I think we settled on one that, I think it was pretty much in agreement. I think that the entire committee kind of gravitated to the one that we ended up selecting, which I always think is a good good choice. There was no 5-4 split or anything like that. I think everybody was in full agreement as to who, uh, who was going to do this. And uh, he's going to relocate, which means he's going to come down here with his family. He's going to buy a house down here. Uh, I just thought it was positive all the way down, and I think it was well handled <coughs> and nicely done. Kathy? That's all in here for tonight is for your approval for this contract. Okay. Any other questions for Kathy? Commissioner Samasco. This one's for Kathy, but maybe you know this bill. On page 9, page 6, item 15, the notices, they list uh, individuals that you can provide notice under the contract to, and they've got Peter Tolley, senior attorney, Foster, uh, Swift Collins Coley. Uh, does he represent uh, Aviation Express, I assume? Yes. Okay. Perhaps we should add uh, Corporation Council. I mean, just so if there's notices going out, it goes to you. But I think it would be, uh, you know, add designated Corporation Council for St. Clair County. That way, an attorney might see something that you might not, you know, appreciate. Now, do you need a motion to uh, amend the, the contract, or, or should we just I don't think so? We just just bring it back in the final document addition, next week, two weeks from now. One of the things I do want to note in the contract, not saying that would happen, but there's a 90 day out clause um, in this. Yeah, so hence now that the county owns the facilities and the assets out there, we have the ability if somebody's not working out to our, you know, liking, for better lack of choice of words, that we're able to you know, um, go out and find somebody else. I think we all feel that our county is a viable asset and if you saw the newspaper here the other day that talked about some of the top priorities um, that nine different areas actually the county airport was one of them um, that was on there and that not yours truly putting it on there that was voted by the blue meets green committee on a larger group which was 75 individuals um, so it is a big asset it needs to be managed right and hopefully we can get an individual in there that will help uh, you know take it to the next level in a way I read this Jeff is it may be terminated by the county not by them just it's one size a one-way street correct right no. I like it <laughs> I knew <you> well <laughs> as chair of this committee I, I like the the fuel cells incentives in that too I, I think that's that's a good uh, because that's been an issue in the past, and to see it in there, uh, that gives that uh, fixed base provider a little more incentive to get out there when he gets a call at two o'clock in the morning, I need to fill my jet. And actually, Mr. Orzo, um, he had even contacted me regarding this, and he knew the other individuals, and he had said that he did previous dealings with them, and he felt that he was the um, you know, most qualified out of the bunch, too. So that's kind of a tight, you know, Okay, uh, any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor of saying this on to the board? Aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Motion carried. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, uh, We have the uh, Smith Creek Landfill Activities Report. Uh, any comments? Uh, been spending a lot of time out there lately. Still moving. Still moving forward on dealing with the issues. Um, other environmental public works matters. Any uh, information only? We have the uh, Semcox public comment period for the transportation uh, improvement program. 
We have the Park and Rec financial documents. We have the uh, City of Port Huron letter regarding the HUD guarantee uh, conference and a letter of support for the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategic Planning Grant. I make the motion to receive and file information only on A e through D. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nays. I uh, would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move. Support. In support, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nays. We are adjourned. And who's taking the next committee here? Ways and Means? Commissioner Bowman. No, Steve's here, no. Oh, I'm I'm actually, I don't have glasses tonight. This spot's really kind of oh, odd. Okay. If you would do it, Jeff, that's great. I can. <laughs> Fortunately, I read this a couple times before I came in. <laughs> I'd like to uh, I'd like to call the uh, Ways and Means Committee to order, please. Roll call. Uh, Commissioner Samasco. Here. Commissioner Heideman. Here. Commissioner Tomian. Commissioner Riley. Here. Commissioner Rushing. Commissioner Greatop. Here. <clears throat> Chairman Bowman. Here. Item number two: additions, deletions, changes to the agenda. Chairman, I would move that uh, under the additions that uh, 2A becomes 7H and 2B becomes 7I. Well, actually, we would just remove the piece of it. Oh, I'm sorry, D. I didn't see that. So, yeah. yes. so delete the convergent design from the D part. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the agenda? I would move that we accept the amended agenda. Support. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Moving on. Citizens will be heard. Are there any citizens for ways and means? Seeing none. Updates? <coughs> any updates to come before the board? Seeing none. Conceptual initiatives? Could I? Oh, no. Would you have something? Okay. Yes. Um, actually, um, I, Ms. Hepting has some information to share with you regarding um, an item that was on your, um, in front of you today. And, and um, to discuss with you the latest on the 2014 budget prep. We received the final copies of our 2012 audit and I passed them out in front of you. They are also available on the county's website Stuart Bovey and Whipple will be coming in, I believe, next month or in September to present the audit to their audit to you, um, the results and any findings that they had. Um, any questions on the audit? Just one, uh, uh, and that is, uh, we ended up in the black. Yes. And yep, the general fund had a slight gain of around fifty-two thousand. From for the two thousand and twelve. Yes. And you've been around for a year or two. Uh, this is how many years that we've come in at budget or in the black. Uh, With maybe a little surplus. I believe every year since I've been here, so around fourteen. Fourteen years. Got. Uh, We've, we've been watching the dollars. Thank you. Um, we, we received back all of our revenue estimates from all the different departments and they've all gone through and reviewed their budgets. So we have a revised number for 2014. Our revised shortfall is just over $1.6 million. Um, that's down significantly from our original projections, mostly due to revenues that are coming in higher than anticipated. Um, state revenues and operational revenues in various departments are all um, seeing an upswing from what we've had in the past few years. So we will be um, emailing this information out to all the departments and then they will go ahead and get started on coming up with their plan to make their cuts. So that is the number now that we are going to run with and yes yeah that's our and this number. is about the time of the year generally when you can get a pretty good idea on that as far as Greg Hill and 
Yeah, we've got good information on most of our state revenues. You know, of course, the state could change something at any time, but based on what we know today, we're, we're pretty confident that this is a good number to go forward with. Questions for Kerry at all? It, uh, just a, another observation comment. Uh, because we've been watching the dollars here, the benefit for the county has been that our, our bond rating has improved substantially over the last, well, since I've been here, 10 years. And as a result, we just uh, rebonded for uh, this building for the remaining nine years and saved, what, 50000 a year? Yes. So. Jail was probably 150 when we did that one too. Rebonded the jail. Yeah, that's about yeah. one. bigger. <clears throat> okay. Anything else for Carrie? Okay. Uh, old business, no old business come for us. Item number seven, change order review committee policy. Bill? <clears throat> sure. Um, I, the county board has had a, uh, a uh, change order committee for, well, a number of years. Um, Unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of standard guidelines that um, department heads that might be working on projects can go to or refer to to ensure that um, they understand when they do need to come to the change order committee and when they don't need to come to the change order committee. So the thought was let's develop some guidelines. They're very simple. Um, um, we've tried to um, present them in a, in a very compact way. Um, we, uh, the key here is to ensure that everyone stays informed about changes that may occur on um, construction projects that we undertake. And certainly we're suggesting that this policy be reviewed on a regular basis by administration as well as the board and if it's appropriate to make changes that we do so. But, um, the primary goal of this is just to provide guidance to staff so they understand when they need to come to you to start talking about changes in the scope of a project or changes in the value, the cost of a project. Yeah, a couple I met with Bill earlier today and I, I've sat on the change order committee on different projects and different things and we first put it in place, it was, a, let's say we were you know, I remember Mark coming in for a hundred dollars, and we we're like, "Come on, you should be able to make the call <laughs> on some of that." It was because it was just some of our own policies that we had put into place. So, uh, another great example was when we were doing the demo work up at the day treatment, the old juvie center up there. They hit a old fuel tank that was in the ground. Okay, they actually had to shut that down so that that change order could come back to the change order committee. It was a week, it was like two weeks, and it was, it was kind of a, I don't say a cluster, but it was something that administration should have had the ability to say, hey, it's five grand, you got to remove the tank, you had to do it anyway, so on and so forth. So change, out, change order policy, obviously we review those things. We need to give administration a little bit of leeway to be able to make those calls on some of those types of things, um, just because, like I said, my, my experience of being on it's good, don't get me wrong, but sometimes, we, you know, there's got to be a little bit of leeway there, and I think, uh, Bill, I have full confidence in him and be able to make the calls on some of that stuff in this particular threshold. So, Howard? Uh, the, the only thing I would really request is that, you know, in any change order thing it, uh, in which the administrator approves it, that we get that message at the next available meeting, you know, so yeah. that. A little it, update on something. Yeah, so Here's we have an update. Yeah. You know, uh, commissioners, we had to make these changes. And, I signed off on this, and, and uh, here's the reason why. As, as is the case with any new policy that's presented to the board, um, you're not asked to act on it when it's initially presented. What we do is present it to you first, and then um, there's a, a, a period of time in which we share it with the other elected officials and the department heads uh, give everybody 30 days to react to it, to review it, to provide some input on um, suggested changes, 
for improvements that they might like to see and then we bring it back to the board for the board to review once again and to take action to implement um, the, uh, the policy. So we're really not asking anything of the board other than make you aware of this. If you've got any concerns before we send it out for review by department heads and other elected officials, please, please let us know. If you don't agree with the concept, the process stops right here. But um, if you do want it to move forward, um, we'll begin that 30-day review process. Hey, Bill, just for the record, how, how long has this change order review committee been in existence? You know, I've been on, I've been in my current position for two and a half, almost three years, and it's been here at least that long. I'm sure it existed long before that. And the policy, prior to implementation of policy, there, there was no policy, there is no policy. Correct. There was, we could find nothing. Does this policy reflect the current practice, or is this a new, a new uh, procedure? It, the procedure is pretty close to what we do right now. It, it mirrors it, but what it does is it creates a little more structure on the threshold, so some of the situations that Commissioner Bohm brought up won't exist. You're, you're codifying what has been in practice for some time and has been working. Correct. So this won't be a surprise to any of the department heads. It a should change. not be. What, what's happened before in change order committees if we're building like the day treatment night watch you know when we did that okay who wants to sit on the change order committee me 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 so you get three people that you would review those things and um, so like I said I've sat on a handful of them and just there's been and, and it's a great tool to have so yeah. you know you get the information it just I know in a couple instances like I said it was we ran into situations the demo projects the one that sticks out clearly in my head we had to shut the whole <laughs> project down we had to put it on hold till we did the change order for the gas tank thing that had to be removed anyways and it was a minimal amount of money so clean up some of those types of things that's a good uh, good suggestion right there uh, Jeff because sometimes when you do jobs like that it can cost you money while you're sitting still uh, I mean a lot of times it's rolled into the people that are doing that particular job yeah. might say okay there's a penalty for us sitting here so yeah. You know, a week or two goes by, it could be a little expensive. So you got to give a little flex in there, I understand. Okay. Thank you. You don't need a motion on this, and uh, you just going to sit on Bring it back I, a little. I think I've got the message you wanted to continue moving forward, and we'll bring it back to you. If we make any changes, we'll let you know what those are, and you can adapt it, hopefully, at a future meeting. Right. Do you appear to track that bill? Don't you want this moved on to full board for action, or you just want to wait? Just wait. Yeah, we won't take action until we get um, input from department heads. So you want to give it a month to get some input from everybody? Correct. <clears throat> okay, item B, Strategic Federal Affairs, the grant rating service continuation. The... Um, when we renewed our contract with SFA last August, I believe it was, um, there was a new service that they offered. We agreed to try that new service for a six month period. It was a grant writing and lobbying service. Um, we agreed to give it a shot um, for six months, see how it worked out, see if it paid for itself, it was worthwhile. And if so, then we would agree to continue um, paying for that service for the duration of the contract. Um, it was a two-year contract. Um, during that period of time, you probably remember um, the um, lobbying firm SFA um, ended their relationship with the key person on their staff that did grant writing. So there was kind of a lull in there. They brought somebody new on, someone you've all met, Mr. John Kerr. Um, he's been showing up at a lot of the department head meetings lately. Um, and um, so we extended that review period simply so we could give it a true six months trial. Well, that six months trial is up. And um, it's the uh, opinion of staff that has been working with SFA and with the department heads that um, the service has been worthwhile. It has more than paid for itself so far and um, actually with the addition of Mr. Kerr to SFA, um, I think they're being much more aggressive 
and reaching out to departments and doing uh, everything they can to try and encourage them to apply for grants and to assist them in the application process, um, actually writing some of the grants on behalf of the county as well. So the recommendation from staff is that the uh, Board of Commissioners um, approve the um, continuation of the additional charge of $1,000 per month for the grant writing services with SFA. Mr. Chair? Oh, go, go ahead. I have a question, that's all. Bill? Um, do we have any dollar figures, Bill, as to how much they have brought in over and above what we would normally have brought in? I guess what I'm looking at is something like the uh, Burn J grant at the prosecutor's office. They do that one every year and yet it's on the list here for SFA. Did SFA go above and beyond and bring us more than we would have gotten? I mean, you know what I'm yeah. Actually, the, the Burn JAG grant program funds many things. Um, you've all seen this here many, many times. Right. Um, this, this program that um, they work with the prosecutor's office was something we haven't done before. Um, that was actually a digital or a computer-based um, prosecution solution or software system that allowed them um, to eliminate some paper and to um, proceed much more quickly with some of their paperwork. It also involved a relationship with many of the local um, police departments. So it was something that we have never tried to apply for before. It was something above and beyond what we usually use the, the JAG grants for. So they actually found another way to use that same money. Yes, and in fact, that's what I was asking. Is correct. So these, all this list of everything we have here is over and above what we would normally have done. Yes, it is. We've made it clear to SFA that we don't want them writing the grants that we normally write ourselves internally. There are some that are just annual grants that are done every single year. Exactly. We get them. We didn't need them to do those. We want right. them to do another thing. That's what this list is. Correct. Okay. So. I have a question too for Administrator Kaufman. So uh, looking at things like working with the Community Foundation as they develop the uh, walk, the water walkway down here, the waterfront, uh, for the, let's say, coastal uh, zone management grants uh, or environmental grants, uh, that, that would all fall into that category too, of where, where we can get federal money to assist in helping develop that whole area. Correct. I, I, I'll use the Maritime Center as a great example. They are extremely involved in the whole Maritime Center process as far as the public-private partnership piece, where the grant opportunities exist, those types of things. At the end of the day, you need somebody to be able to kind of carry the ball on some of these things, and I can tell you that they've been really good as far as, you know, here's different opportunities, you know, that are available. So as you're collecting this information, you know, you're piecing this thing together and, and uh, um, you know, here's how you're going to make it happen if it's going to happen. So they've been. Well, those funds are out there and, and if they're available, uh, we just will get them. Uh, do you need a motion on this? If so, I would make the motion that uh, we uh, uh, continue our uh, uh, grant service uh, agreement uh, with uh, strategic federal affairs. Court. <coughs> uh, just, just to move it on the full board, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Item C, the health department request for revisions to Manning Table, Dr. Mercantant, and Greg. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. As a prelude to our request for the Manning Table changes, I'd like to just share briefly um, a little bit of an overview of what the health department is, is working towards and what our vision is. Um, it's no secret that our appropriations have dwindled dramatically since I've come on board. Um, last Greg and I looked, it was close to a 30% overall reduction. In, rev in, in appropriations, we've tried very hard to make lemons out of lemonade. We have used our diminished staff more creatively. We've cross-trained. Um, we've tried very hard to improve our revenues. The bottom line is you can only make so much revenue with a, you know, bare bones kind of staff. 
An even more important factor is that every agency in this county is looking at transformation of how they deliver service, reducing redundancies, collaborating. And I believe and, and, and we know that we have expertise, evidence-based programs and interventions that can really make a lot of our community programs and our health care delivery systems more efficient and more effective. That means better revenue for us as a health department and probably more importantly better outcomes for the population. Everyone is being held to population outcome standards and we are a population health outcome expert at the health department. We need to transform our staff and um, make that happen. So as we have opportunities with retirements and vacancies, we are going to be coming to you asking for changes in how those um, staff are refilled. Um, sometimes you have to spend money to make money, and I do believe we're at that point where if we want to generate a different kind of service, a more productive service to the community, we are going to need different kinds of staff and some of them are going to have to have a little bit more professional uh, credentialing. So uh, today is simple. Today we're looking at um, trans um, planting a coordinator position in our vision and hearing services for two part-timers. That's an overall savings. We don't need a coordinator in that position. And we're also asking to replace a WIC position with a nurse. And this has been an ongoing effort of mine to take our services and coordinate them so that we don't have silos of services. And a WIC, a nurse, will cost more. But for instance, the ability to have a nurse in that position, uh, we can start doing something called fluoride varnishes, which is a service, an outpatient service that WIC uh, commonly does if there are nurses available to do it. And we've estimated it can generate anywhere between forty and $60,000, depending on our billing. So uh, that's a simple example of how taking current um, vacancies and changing them, perhaps sometimes to a staff that costs a little bit more, but we can do a lot more with that person. So the question in front of you today is the Manning table change for the, the WIC position and the vision and hearing. But uh, the preface is that we are going to be coming forward over the next um, several weeks and months talking to you about uh, more of these kind of changes that will allow us to be more functional um, on your behalf. Questions? I have a question. Dr. Mercantot, on your, uh, you mentioned WIC a couple of times. Is that the nutritionist position that's referred to in here? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, so WIC has traditionally been run just by nutritionists and dietitians and clerical positions. We found that by putting nurses into some of those positions, which is um, acceptable by the WIC programming, costs a little bit more to pay a nurse, but they provide a, a much broader and higher quality level of service to the clients. Now, in, in regards to those services coming from uh, the, the nurse, the registered nurse, uh, those billing services are billed to, billed to uh, Medicaid or to Medicare, so we get reimbursement for it? Those services that can be billed to Medicaid and third-party payer insurances are uh, WIC is a siloed federal funded program. Uh, what is WIC is WIC. Yeah. And I, what, is, yeah. what is other services. But we have a, a method to d differentiate those. But yes, we can pull out billable services while those clients are in front of us. Lead screening is another example. Oh, okay. And that wouldn't be co covered under uh, women, infant, and children. WIC. WIC does not pay for non WIC services, but if the provision, if we we do those services and we um, do a cost um, share kind of assessment there we we can go ahead and bill for them separately excellent am I correct to uh, in reading this that the uh, cost of that nurse is uh, in the services she's going to be billing out is just about a wash no there would be a significant improvement in revenue I believe well, I was looking at the uh, billable hours about thirty-five to forty thousand, and I, I see her wage. Uh, You're not paying the nutritionist. Anymore. Yeah. Correct. Okay. That, yeah, the nutritionist That's would be um, yeah, that okay. position would be held vacant. Right. Okay, that answered that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Any other questions? No questions. Motion to send it on to the full board. Support. Second. Oh, go ahead. Okay, any further? Commissioner Riley. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Item number D. Thank you, Doctor. The Convention Center Professional Service Contract Amendments for CSL. Couple um, things. You want to talk a little bit about a bill? I'm going to take team this sure. with you. Too. Sure. Um, CSL is the firm that um, is represented by um, Bill Kruger. Many of you have met him numerous times. Um, we hired him originally to help us ensure that the design of the convention center um, would um, fit the market that we were looking for, that we felt we could attract to this area for conventions and other types of events um, up at the site. The other thing that Mr. Kruger was hired for is to assist us with a lot of the organizational issues. Um, they may be room block agreements with the hotel to ensure that we've got adequate rooms reserved when a convention is coming into town. They could be um, ensuring that we've got um, adequate policies and procedures in place to um, ensure that we can adequately attract um, some of these um, events that might come in from around the state as well. Um, he also was brought on to help us um, ensure that we've got a good strong relationship and understanding with the hotel management group and with the restaurant management group that we're going to be sharing the building with and sharing some services with. Um, so all of his tasks were not re necessarily related to overseeing some of the design elements, but more of it was really to help us with some of the internal organizational challenges that we faced. You know, obviously this is a project none of us have been involved with in the past. And getting it right the first time is extremely important. And that's one of the areas that Mr. Kruger excels in. When his contract was presented to you originally, it did not include um, a um, set figure. Um, what it did is it included a um, series of tasks that he would perform, described as the scope of work that he would perform for us, and it included an hourly rate for himself and others within his organization that might assist us. Then what we did was we sat down with Mr. Kruger and we said, well, how much do you think, how much time do you think it will take to accomplish each one of these tasks? Um, he then provided us with a figure and we came up with um, what we presented to you, which was a not to exceed cost of $40,000 for his services. Um, over the last um, couple of months, um, the scope of our project has changed. Um, we have been able to um, bring the city of Port Huron um, into this project and um, they have agreed to cooperate with the county and jointly um, um, agree on the hiring of a venue management group, which is SMG. We've talked about that the last couple of months. And SMG will be managing the um, convention facility as well as managing McMoran Auditorium for the city and under a, a separate understanding with the city. <coughs> but as a result of him getting involved in that process, which is something I don't think anyone envisioned would happen when this began, um, we have incurred additional costs. So what we've got before you today is a request that we extend the not to exceed figure for Mr. Um, Kruger's contract by $30,000. We have talked to him, asked him what he thinks um, additional work he's got to do, how much longer he thinks it will take to finish out this project and we feel confident that the $30,000 will do that. One thing to keep in mind, um, since we've begun um, using Mr. Kruger with the city of um, Port Huron and the McMoran project, um, some of our expenses um, are directly related to um, tasks that he has completed on behalf of the city and on behalf of McMoran. Um, I have been talking with the city administration about this issue and about the estimated um, additional work that needs to be done. They have agreed that um, the city does have a responsibility to pay for their share of the work. So as we move forward with billings, 
Um, Mr. Kruger will advise us what portion of the billing he believes is um, attributed to the City of Port Huron and McMoran um, side of the project and what he feels is attributed to our side. So when I um, bring this to you, I can't tell you exactly what the split will be. It depends on the type of work that's going to occur over the next probably five or six months as we finish up the work with Mr. Kruger. When you, the, I, I'm sorry, I'll I'm let sorry, you just, no, just one, finish, yep. okay, one more thing. Um, we have made it perfectly clear to everyone involved in this project, and I think if you talk to our construction manager or you talk to some of our other project partners, whether it's the hotel investor and uh, the restaurant investor, that um, we've got a, a, a cap on the cost of this project. And um, I have used the analogy before of building a house. When you set a budget for a house, you set it, that budget at $100,000, and if somebody in your family decides that they want to do something different with the house and it's going to cost an extra $5,000, then you've got to find somewhere else to cut $5,000 so you can stay at $100,000. That's exactly what will be going occurring here. Um, if we've got additional costs that we've got to expend on one element of the project, we've got to find a trade-off. We've got to find somewhere else where we might be able to realize some savings. Um, we have, as we progress with this project, been able to find some savings with some of the contracts that um, we've undertaken. Um, and um, so this will not re represent any increase in the overall cost of the project as it's planned. I think that was uh, one of the concerns, and we did speak on this a little bit. Uh, uh, it, uh, the cap of the $9 million, I know, was a, was a big uh, concern of people. And knowingly that we've got this when the people need additional, they, they immediately think you're going over and above. And I think what you just said was that we're, it's because of his contract and we're, gonna, we're, we're still at the nine million contract, we're gonna stay at the nine million contract, so we're not going over it. And we'll just find another spot in there uh, that, or maybe a saving somewhere else. So, but we're staying within what, what was put down as the nine million contract, so we're not going over that. Um, so I, 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 I agree. If if we we're going the nine million plus additionals, additionals, then I can see where people have a problem. But if we're going in the direction that you just said, I, I don't have a problem. I want to just be clear on that because what we're asking Mr. Kruger to do is totally different than what we hired him originally to do. We hired him to do a specific thing, and I think everybody found a comfort level with that back on March 12th, and as we worked with him, um, on January was actually the first meeting that I had with the McMoran Authority Board because then the discussion started talking about the professional management piece. When we first brought Mr. Kruger on, we never talked to him about we are hiring you to actually put a management, A, to go help us find a professional management group, SMG Venue Works, right. Global Spectrum. That was never part of it. So we need help th th doing that. Then we need help to facilitate all these different groups, Convention Visitors, Bureau of McMoran Authority. How are we going to piece this together? And we all felt that he was the guy that would be able to help us do this. So his, his scope of work has been additional work because he's still doing what we had hired him initially to do. The McMoran Convention Center, McMoran piece kind of evolved after we had hired him for other specifics. And the reason we picked him, to be quite frank, because I think everybody, whether you supported the project or not, we all felt that we had the right guy in Mr. Kruger and his ability to do this, hence he's done at other places. So when you talk about the change, it's, we, we, we essentially hired him took him on to do a whole another task force that was right. was an original part of it. But I do agree with Bill and I don't think, you know, talking with the city of Port here and they understand that they're receiving benefit from this and so are we. By having Mr. Kruger being able to put these agreements together and get the synergies and those types of things in the staff, essentially it's gonna save you money in the long run because you would be required to have X amount of staff for the 
convention center, McMoran, if he can pull all these things together, then I think, uh, well, I know, I know it's going to be able to, to, to save money, and that's the intent of putting all those under a professional management group. I, so. Well, I think, uh, too, Jeff, I think the, uh, the original, uh, and I don't know if you discussed that before I came on the board or not, but the, to have somebody professional run the entities that you're talking about, for instance, uh, McMoran and, and the convention center, only makes sense because if you don't have somebody run it that knows how to run it, um, you know, you can't have a hotel run it, you can't have none of us sitting up here are qualified to run something like that. So going in that direction, I think, is proper to have somebody run it that knows what's out there and how to bring people in. Some are going to fit in McMoran and some are going to fit in the convention center. I think that's the way to go. But uh, the question is, when, when we do those things, uh, be whatever it is, then we got to stay within our budget, and, and that's what, just what Bill said, and I certainly agree. As long as we're staying at the nine million, I believe was the number, then then I we're we're doing the right thing. Just we did budget additional money for uh, these kinds of services in, in that original budget that we set up. So it's not like we're dipping into some other area. We we set aside money for. Uh, Architecture, engineering, and that, that was a, a, additional. Uh, my thought, though, of course, is that if we put in more work now, because this is complicated to to bring in a joint management agreement with uh, the city of Port Huron, the McMoran Authority, and the county, and and to make sure it works for all of us, because. Uh, you know, if this is a win-win for the McMoran complex, and it's a win-win for the county convention center, it's going to be a huge win for the community. You know, the synergies of the the two projects together. But we have to make sure we get it right. And I don't think there's anyone on this board that doesn't feel that Bill Kruger is the right person to help us make that. You know, I don't think there's anyone else that I came across that that. Uh, has the kind of expertise he does. Well, it's good to hear too that the city is uh, willing to uh, pick up part of that too, and uh, and even though it's in that night, they have to go back before their yeah, board right. to put words in their mouth. But they've expressed interest because they understand his capacity now. When he works on these things, is a joint city and county portion of it. I still go back to the original. What we hired him originally to do was, you know. X, Y, and Z, and he's fulfilling that. And while we had him in town, we gave, we, you know, we hired him yeah. to do a whole nother oh, I was there. set of yeah. things. So, well, Steve, it's, cer it's certainly right that they should because yeah. they're the bed they're getting benefit too here. I, I guess what I'd like to see this board do is get get your numbers nailed down, not only on what additional work this thirty thousand will do and who will cost share on that. But also, what portion of our 40 has already benefited the city, and, and put that in as well. And I would think that it would be prudent for this board to send this to the city first, rather than just go 30 grand more. And I know it's a lot of, not a lot of money on a project of this size, but I think there's a principle here. We engaged Kruger. We spent resources finding Kruger. We've spent getting him up to speed on this whole process. And from everything I've gathered, from what Jeff and, and Bill have said and what I've looked into previously, is this additional work he's doing for this joint operating agreement with SMG and McMoran and all that really is the cause of this need to increase those fees. And I think that should be a city issue first because it will tell me what they put on the table, what their interest is to support this project, to be a partner, you know. I don't like the idea of let's increase it and we'll have some discussions with the city. This needs to go to the city first. They need to commit maybe all the 30 because of what we've spent so far. And then it's easy for us because the city is a good partner. They step up to the plate and off we go. I'd really like to see that because if it doesn't happen, that would also give me another indication of, of lack of partner. So I think that's really important we do that, not just increase it here. If we send this on to our full board, which is in two weeks, I don't know if the city's got a meeting in the time that they can have a discussion regarding that. 
I, I couldn't tell you. I'm okay. not sure what they're. Mr. Shouty, do you know their schedule? I happen to know their schedule. Um, <laughs> and no, they have uh, they have canceled their second meeting of the month. So their next meeting, I believe, would be the uh, the second Monday of August. I think they have a special meeting tonight, and then the uh, the next meeting would be the second Monday of August, whatever date that is. Well, and the other thing too, I think they'd be inclined to be a little more generous if we hadn't taken action. If it's like, let's see what you fellows will do, and then we'll, if we do do it, there'd be a disincentive to to come on board. I think so. That that that's a, a good point. However, our our concern too is how soon do we want to have this professional manager in place? How soon do we want a decision on? on a manager for this then. Well, because he's going to continue to work with SMG to refine our agreement with them and part of that process. So do you, and we but need what, to bring What's our in. target date? Do, do we want someone that the hotel presumably is scheduled to open in, um, in uh, first of August, late July, first of August. Uh, part of that facility will be uh, convention areas that we will have. Now, they're very minor, it shouldn't be a big problem to, to manage. But how soon do we want a manager in place? Uh, do, we, do we want one by the end of the year? What, what's, our tar uh, what's our time frame? I, I guess I really haven't. Actually, I've, I have been talking with SMG about this, and um, our thought is um, probably within um, three or four months after the opening of the facility, we will want them there. And when we get to the oh, point we'll, we'll where- Build it first out and then- yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the, the opening of the ballroom, which is the first sec portion that we will own. That's the first area that we will begin renting. Um, so we're looking at some time in late fall that we would want a manager um, here. I don't know what the city's timeline is, and in fact, we've got a meeting scheduled, um, I believe it's Monday, um, to sit down with the city to talk about the timing issues and how we move forward, July 22nd, and how we move forward with <coughs> SMG. Steve? And to comment on Howard's point, sure, it's important to get these things done as soon as possible because it's going to put us in that much better position. but. The city has bylaws that provide for special meetings. There's no reason official action can't be taken very quickly on this if it's important to the city. I don't want to say we need to rush this just because yeah. I'm oh, not I, taking that on ourselves. I, I'm, I'm not. Okay. What I'm saying is, you know, if we're not, uh, we're not really pressured to have a manager in place for four or five months, yes. well, then there's, there's no big pressure for us to, to make move on this immediately. We'll, we'll pass on the full board if we don't have our ducks in the row. We can table it on our end. Yeah, we can that's right. get this thing together with the city. We can bring it back at a committee meeting and you know, you know, pass out but let's just we'll just send it on. We'll get Bill to work with Bruce and they can kinda get their time frames now, together down. The city manager's leaving. Bruce Brown is retiring. Is that are we having a switch there too or no? Yeah. It's early next year. Next year, okay. Uh, just, just one other comment, if I could, about the uh, uh, the nine million dollars for the total build out of this thing. You know, everything that we've talked about, we're we're not going to exceed that. But keep in mind, when we did that first walkthrough and we rolled out the the well the architectural view, and they saw that solid wall, and they said, "Got to have windows." Yeah. Those cost extra. You know, so staying within this nine million, we're going to do it. But we added the windows; they're there, looking good. And so, uh, but but it's going to be it's going to be tight. Steve, on that point, Bill, you know, you say we'll not increase the cost. I know there's a certain component of this project for soft costs and consultants and engineers and things of that nature. So I'm assuming what you're telling me is this additional 30, if we were to pay that from the county, that would, there are funds already allocated for that purpose. It's not gonna diminish other aspects of the facility because we're reaching into 
you know, the construction piece of it, uh, because you know, I want that. I think that's what you're telling. Me, right? Correct. There are aspects of the project that have already been bid, and they've either come in under what we estimated or um, contracts we've recently secured that um, have come in lower than what we anticipated. So we've had some savings. And as a result, yes, if I need uh, $10,000. It's not coming from the general fund. It's not affecting operations of the county. It's coming from what's part of that, part of that pot. That's, that's important. And I think that's what the people uh, out in the county has to hear. I mean, I think that's, that's super important. Yeah, we I, I agree with the, your, your thought there. And if the, looks like the city meeting would be about August 12th be the second Monday. They can have so a special meeting too. There's no reason we yeah, do it all the time they, if we have they something. Can, but if they don't, I mean we're not under the gun here. I I, I think you hit a good point there. Okay. Uh, enough discussion on that. This is just to move it on to the full board and get Bill to continue to work with Bruce and if we got a table it for the time being so be it. But uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Item number E, the day treatment night watch restructure. We've got Gary here. Good evening again. Um, due to a shrinking census and continuing budget problems that uh, the county is looking at, although that has uh, decreased, uh, fortunately, we had made the decision to close the juvenile detention center and the residential treatment program. As part of that, what we are proposing is that our uh, current day treatment night watch program, which has been in existence for uh, approximately 18 years, has been a very successful program. Um, we are proposing that we restructure that and add to uh, that program an intensive day treatment night watch program. Um, to service uh, a lot of the kids that would be uh, normally in the detention center or the residential treatment program. Um, what we, as I, um, you have in your handouts, um, the total number of uh, full-time staff that we have at both the juvenile center and at day treatment totals 35. Uh, with the restructuring, we will still have uh, 35 full-time employees, but we will reduce the number of part-time employees from a total of 42 to five. Um, and what we are looking at is uh, approximate savings of $1,120,215. Um, less state reimbursement of 560,107 for a net estimated savings of $560,108. Um, research shows that treating um, children and families within the community and within their own homes is a preferred uh, treatment choice. Uh, we've proven that uh, with our day treatment night watch program and um, so we are pros proposing tonight and looking for your approval of uh, restructuring that program um, and Making it in, making in addition to it an intense day treatment night watch program. Mm -hmm. uh, just a question. Uh, when, when you say, when you're saying we, you're talking about the probate judges. The court, yes. A probate court. Well, family division, yes. Family division, and those are circuit judges. Yes. If you, uh, if under the Judiciary and Public, Sa Pub Judiciary and Public Safety Committee meeting, we just approved or sent onto the full board community mental health aspect of the day two midnight watch, but you've mentioned that at that time that that does not include this new program that you're? Not at this time. So will we have to negotiate with community <clears throat> mental health for services for the uh, aggressive or the, the newer piece you're talking about doing? We have. Um in our budget estimates, we have figured in our own uh, clinical services at this time. But like I said, we are meeting with Community Mental Health next week uh, to review uh, what agreements we could make with them. And if 
again, uh, if they can give us a deal similar to what we have, we would certainly go that route as opposed to doing our own. Because like I said, for $60,000 for two clinical therapists, uh, you can't find that anywhere. So our estimates are a little bit higher for the, the two that we would hire. Can you use the clinical therapist, the, the date treatment in your new aggressive program? Yes, the, uh, the proposal is that uh, both the staff at the current day treatment eye watch program and the proposed intense program would be interchangeable. Uh, so they would each be familiar with uh, each side of it, which helps us with our staffing um, and really helps with the overall program. Jeff, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, I appreciate meeting uh, last, we last met to talk about this. Uh, I know you're going to talk to Judge Brown about it. Did that, is that tomorrow? Yes. Okay, you're meeting Judge Brown tomorrow. Just for the record, so that all the commissioners know how this, how this rolls out, um, you're going to talk about circuit judges and so forth. Well, Judge Brown's a probate judge. He's also family division. Right. You know, there's, it, what you call them isn't is so important as as I see this we need you need to get I want to myself personally I want to see where Judge Brown comes down on this proposal because what Judge Brown does he's very passionate about service for the kids and this board wants to support that I'm sure of that if a if a young person gets into trouble and the court takes jurisdiction first level he talks about uh, preference of home treatment which is everyone would like to see the kids treated at home uh, behavior contracts treated uh, on probation not detained not put into residential treatment but I know from talking to Judge Brown because I'm up there a lot and I see what he does and I was a court administrator in the probate division of Sandwick for a while doing a lot of the same things and I know the, understand the budget piece of it but you can put a kid on probation some of them they get it some don't some go to the next level intensive probation some of those get it some don't. Then you go on to day treatment, night watch. They're in the home, they come in for services, treatment, they go home at night. That works for a certain portion as well. But you can draw a line right under day treatment, night watch for home treatment versus out of home treatment. And typically out of home treatment was detention, just lock yep. them up. Well, day treatment, night watch was something that Grant Nixon had put together, uh, or the residential treatment rather, to so the county can get the benefit of reimbursement of the child care fund and also give the court an alternative for residential treatment that's not just straight detention. In residential treatment, they get social issues taken care of. They get uh, psychological and mental health issues taken care of. In detention, you can get some schooling, but you're locked up and maybe get your GED. That's it. That's what you get. So I know from Judge Brown's perspective, when I go through this litany of some get it on probation, intensive probation, day treatment, night watch, he feels very strong. There's a certain percentage of those kids that have to come out of the home because the parents, when the court takes jurisdiction of the child, they also take jurisdiction of the parents. And Judge Brown runs a pretty tight ship. And nobody, if for the attorneys, for the litigants, for the parties, for the kids, for the family, and, and that's the piece I think he's really worried about because he's, gonna, he's not going to take kids that need residential or detention treatment and put them on the other side of the fence back in day treatment night watch. He's going to lock them up. And, if, and we don't have a detention center to lock them up, he's going to send them out, of, out county to lock them up. Or, you know, so that's going to change all of our numbers. So I know you're meeting with Judge Brown, and I've tried to meet, I've talked to him a few times about it, and, I'm, and Judge Kelly, see, with our one court of justice, and Judge Kelly's our chief judge, I've been told by Judge Brown that Judge Kelly and him are going to work close together, and Judge Kelly says for him to, to get that worked through, and I want to see, I think this is something we need to see come to this board on a recommendation from Judge Kelly, because he is the chief judge of this circuit, you know, with working through his staff and through the subordinate judges and through Gary and all that, rather than just send it to full board now. I don't think it's ready to go to full board. I, I you know, I would hate to see it just go up to full board and us not know what's going on with the whole other piece. So I don't think it's ready to go to full board. Well, we are, we will provide uh, Judge Brown with alternatives for, and we realize there are kids that have to be in detention. There are kids that are gonna have to be sent out. We are in the process of uh, finalizing contracts with surrounding counties for those services um, but we feel that we're providing alternative services uh, that can uh, hit the majority of those kids and yes the ongoing discussions with the judges is but understand the decision 
uh, for placement lies strictly with Judge Brown on those issues. Yes, it and does. he's quite passionate on you know what services these kids will get. And they may not go to the cheapest facility, you know, the, the, the most, they say cheapest, but the most economically advantageous. He may send them to a different facility because of what they provide for the kid. And if we're doing this for a cost saving things, I just want to keep our eyes on that number it so we don't, we, we, we don't have a problem later and also a disservice to the kids. So I just want a little more, make sure that piece gets handled. I want to see where Judge Brown comes down and where Judge Kelly comes mm -hmm. down before this board passes. But when you when you have a facility and you're staffed to house 70, correct me if I'm wrong, and you're running 28, it doesn't take long to figure out that this, you know, you've got to right. look we at have, some other alternatives. We have a tremendous space out there that's underutilized. And I think they had a budget of additional monies in anticipation that you are going to have to send some additional yes, we did. people out. So, that you know, they, they've talked through those issues. and. There again, uh, they're going to meet on Friday. We can send this uh, two weeks. We're talking uh, down to right, the full board sorry. and in the, the middle of time. If it's not ready to go, then so be it. But he has been in front of Judge Kelly. He's talked to Judge Kelly about it. Judge Kelly's presiding judge. You know, you talk about the commissioners getting involved in these decisions. It's ultimately up to the, the courts. And I think Gary, I commend him for a bringing this before us. But I know he's done his homework over there too on it, and done some some of the meetings and those types of things. So let it, let him. Uh, and Bill's going to be part of that meeting on on Friday, and then uh, if there's some other additional alternatives that maybe come out of this, there's some tweaks to it that uh, the judges would like to see. I'm I'm all ears for it. You know? You're just saying to me you don't you don't go forward with it until the court has that figured out. I mean, we're putting it on in two weeks for action. Maybe we won't take action. I get that, but we why not that. just? Yeah get it done first and then put it on for action and get her done. You know. I think it's also possible, if, if I'm hearing this all correctly, there's a $560,000 savings that you're looking at. Um, that figure could go down a little bit depending on where some of these kids are sent by some of the judges. Or that figure could also go up because you have some money built in there. And if the judges do not utilize all of that money that you have budgeted in there, obviously you're going to make more money. Five hundred and sixty thousand could be could be higher. Could go higher. Yes, we've been we I think fairly conservative with yeah, that figure. We don't figure. know how many kids are in that space in there uh, until we actually do it. So we don't let's know. talk about when you were on the other side of the fence, Steve, because you were in San Juan County. You guys didn't have ten cents to run yeah, together had, to do see, any type of programming. Several years you know. ago, I was a administrator of the juvenile division for San Juan County, and their budget was very, very austere. And Judge Maltby, who's since retired was very cooperative with the board. He, he would only send kids subject to what funds he had to send kids. And, you know, that's not necessarily how it works. If the judge thinks a kid needs service, he can send them for service. I think that's what Judge Brown would do. If this kid needs service, they're going to get the service regardless of what's budgeted. So that is a bit of a difference. So. Yeah. And, oh, I'm sorry. I, I would just, uh, a couple of comments. Uh, obviously the court is requesting this I'm a little reluctant to try to tell the judges how to manage their you know their responsibilities but I also recall that you know when we had to send juveniles away for special services before we built our facility uh, it wasn't uncommon to hear that it was costing us three hundred dollars a day for some of these juvies and so uh, well, you could burn through a lot of money in a hurry at $300 a day. Well, in, like I said, Mr. Heidemann, we are looking at surrounding counties for uh, programs that they already have in existence. I've had three counties uh, reach out to us uh, offering uh, services that uh, are actually less than what we're paying in our own facility. We've also looked at the numbers, and since we opened the residential treatment program uh, seven years ago, I believe, uh, the numbers have gone steadily down. At that time, we brought back approximately 43 uh, kids back into our county. Uh, right now, in our, in our entire building, uh, today we have 32. That's in the entire building. That's in county detention. So the number of juvenile petitions coming in are down. Probation cases are down. Average daily population in our center is down. So as the court administrator, my job is to manage the resources of the court and provide those services. And I can't justify keeping a half-empty building um, 
with a full at, staff. at that cost, I'm with a full I'm staff. I'm assuming your Macombs and your Oaklands are running into similar situations, and you can't have a half full facility here. You can't have a half full facility in Macomb, Oakland. So it does make sense, I think, from a county perspective, to be able to reach out to some of these other counties and say, "Hey, if there's a void, we can help you with your problem," and you know, vice versa, too. So yes, in every there's 16 juvenile centers across the state. And everyone we've talked to, populations are down and have been going down. And um, in fact, nationally, uh, 40 states, I believe in 2012, uh, reported decreases in their population in closing juvenile centers. Well, I, I would interpret that as a good thing. Well, I, yeah, I would hope it is. And again, we've been very successful with the, the programs that we've had. Um, and we're not you know, just emptying the, the institution or suggesting that, we are providing alternatives and we feel that, you know, certainly the research that we show or have read and that we've shown in our own county, um, we can be effective in treating those. The intensive program is not going to be like uh, day treatment. It's going to be seven days a week. They're going to be there uh, pretty much 12 hours a day. The parents are going to be involved in monitoring their behavior in the evening. And as Mr. Smasco said, yeah, there are some parents that, you know, that's not going to happen because they're not going to monitor it. And those are <coughs> the types of kids that we would look at, yeah, we would probably have to put them in a placement someplace. But it just um, makes sense to, to, to do this with the, the shrinking population. One other question for Gary. This issue of the declining uh, juvenile population, Gary, and I, you may not know this, but is that a function of the changing of the societal demographics? In other words, are there less juveniles to get in trouble? Are, you know, the baby boomers are going up, Generation X is coming. Is it a shrinking population of juveniles we're serving, or you know, are we just more successful in making better young people? I mean, maybe you don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah, I, it seems to be the trend, and again, it, with Michigan's economy the way it's been, I don't know if folks have been, you know, moving out. But like I said, um, since I've been in this position for the last three years, the numbers have been steadily going down on a daily basis, almost. So, Bill, yeah. uh, <clears throat> this might be a little late to talk about this right now, but we have a, a very nice facility over there. Have we looked at maybe using our facility? as opposed to using Macomb. I mean, we're going to Macomb because they're only half full and somebody else is only half full. Have we thought about maybe we should be the facility that is full and we bring them into us? Well, we have reached, you know, with the declining population, as I said, I have reached out to surrounding counties and especially those counties that don't even have a detention center. And again, keeping in mind, it's not a mandated service to have it. As I said, only 16 counties have them at this point in time. Um, and the only, um, well, let me take that back. Lapeer County has sent a few kids to us that we've housed, and Sanilac County recently sent one. And that was, you know, over the last three years. That's not enough, though, to make it effective to have it open. And, it, and it, it's, you can't count on it. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Just move it on to full board and let us know how the rest of it shakes with the uh, meetings with the judges. That's what I see. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Moving on, item Thank you. F, the Workman's Thank you. Compensation <clears throat> Contract Renewal. <coughs> Mr. Kaufman. Sure. Um, currently, the county's uh, workers' compensation um, coverage, um, we're self-insured for workers' comp. However, we do hire a third-party administrator to run the program for us. And you'll see in the memo the type of um, services that they do provide to us. Um, we've had the same provider for 36 years. Um, we have talked internally about um, going out just to ensure that we're getting the, the best rates that we can, kind of do a market check. And we've done that a number of times with a number of services here um, the last few years. Um, so our intent is to begin the process of seeking proposals for um, third-party administrator for a workers' comp program. Um, however, we realize that's going to take some time to do, and um, our current contract with Broadspire will ex um, expire um, later on this year. 
in fact, in, uh, in late August. So what we're looking to do is extend our existing contract with Broadspire for a period of 12 months. And during that 12-month period, um, we'll take the steps that are necessary to um, analyze our current program and to um, request proposals to see if um, we can uh, have this service provided to us at uh, a, a less cost to the to the county. Questions for Mr. Kaufman at all? Just move it on. Motion to move it on. Second. Board. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed. Item number G: the employment agreement for the veterinary technician for A. Berry. <clears throat> Would you like to talk about that, Mr. Muxel? <laughs> <laughs> Got to give you some TV time since you've sit, been sitting here so long. Okay, we were contacted by uh, Kerry's office. Uh, due to IRS regulations, the part-time veterinary technician will no longer be able to be classified as a contract employee. They've been a contract employee since we took over uh, uh, animal control. Uh, that they, she needed to be moved to part-time employee status to uh, meet uh, IRS guidelines, regulations. Uh, by moving her to a part-time employee, there won't be any additional hours, there won't be an additional pay. It'll be the same amount of hours and the same amount of pay that she receives currently. Any questions at all, Bill? Is that uh, just a veterinary technician? Yeah, she's a licensed veterinary technician that works under uh, Joe Rail, our veterinary that comes into the uh, clinic. I was she treats the dogs and cats that come in, gets them ready for adoption. I was just looking at the salary and I didn't think you could hire it. No. no. Uh, she also uh, kind of works with Baker College that saved us a lot of money as far as uh, spaying and neutering the animals. And Very good. You need a motion? I would so move. No, it's four. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, item number H, the Board of Commissioners meeting schedule revisions. One I would like you to take note is the July 24th. It's going to be a Wednesday because this whole Thursday thing between boat night next Thursday at we're doing our traveling thing. I'd really like to get you guys down to the city of St. Clair. Livestock sales, a, Fairs, li Livestock tonight. sales, Steve, and a couple of commissioners are very involved in the um, Goodles uh, thing. So we felt that the Wednesday would work, and I'd really like to get, uh, as part of the traveling circuit, I'd like to get you guys down to St. Clair to see the setup that is going on for the uh, boat races, because that's our big weekend. Since your boat and, sank, we are not on your and, boat. Uh, <laughs> No, we're going to do it at the pavilion in the St. Clair Boat Harbor. When you come into the city marina in St. Clair, there's the pavilion right there on the uh, left-hand side. On the south side or the north side of the river? Uh, it's on the south. south side of the river. When you come into St. Clair, you go over the bridge in the city marina. You pull in there, you'll be able to see the pavilion. I will be hosting that. It is casual. Attire is required. So leave the suits and ties at home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to be doing the meeting down there at the pavilion. It is July 24th, which is a Wednesday. The, uh, and then there are some other things on here as far as with our traveling meeting schedules we're going to be having. Our the uh, members of the Elginac Lions that normally meet on Wednesday will bow to the uh, Livestock Committee. I guess they're more important, so we'll bow to you and we'll go to Wednesday. Thank you, Commissioner so, Greytop. Bill? Before you leave this, if you take a look at September, um, earlier this year we set a joint meeting for the County Planning Commission and the Board of Commissioners for August. They requested that we bump that out to September and they've provided two potential dates, September 12th and September 26th, and they're leaving it up to you to decide um, when you would like to do that. Really matter? Well, it, it does because we tentatively scheduled in here on September 26th a budget workshop at 5:30. So that would be problematic, I think, to also have yeah. that joint meeting unless we had it much earlier. 
let's say at 3.30. You know what, let's just keep it on the 12th for now. Let's see how the August thing shakes out. You, you want to have it on the 12th? And pick I the mean, earlier one if it doesn't work, you can bump it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. that's what I'm thinking the 12th, and then just keep the workshop on the 26th. Do we need a motion to have it on the 12th, or? No, no, I mean, it's on our schedule. To, you, you do need a motion. Oh, for the, the, the new the okay, new schedule? New schedule, okay. yes. I would so move. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Other ways and means matters? Information only, items number A through C. <coughs> the motion to receive and file those items. The vote. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Receive and file packets. Motion. All, somebody, second. Howard, all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> those opposed, adjournment. All moved. Moved. Howard, second. All in favor. Aye. <laughs> Adjournment. We hope you enjoyed this week's St. Clair County Board of Commissioners meeting. Your St. Clair County Commissioners broadcast these meetings on Comcast Local Access Channel 12 every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. If you have any questions on any part of this program, please feel free to contact your St. Clair County Board of Commissioners or staff. You can find their contact information, the meeting agenda, and videos of the meetings at www.stclaircounty.org.